Despite the cultural and political marginalization of Anglo-Saxon heritage, modern genetic studies confirm that the Anglo-Saxons left a major imprint on the British population. Between 10% to 40% of modern British DNA comes from Anglo-Saxon ancestry, with the highest concentrations found in eastern and southern England, where the Anglo-Saxons first settled. Y-DNA haplogroups I1, R1A and R1BU106 are strongly linked to Anglo-Saxon male lineage, indicating a significant contribution to the male population. Meanwhile, mtDNA evidence shows a blend of native Celtic and Germanic lineages, with haplogroups H, U5 and K being the most common. This means that while the Anglo-Saxons assimilated into existing British populations, their genetic influence remains measurable even today. Yet, despite this clear genetic legacy, the Anglo-Saxon contribution to British history and identity has often been downplayed or overlooked. One key reason for this is the political desire to promote national unity over historical divisions. After the Acts of Union that created the United Kingdom, political leaders sought to construct a unified British identity that transcended the regional differences between England, Scotland and Wales. Emphasising Anglo-Saxon ancestry could have alienated parts of the population with stronger Celtic or Viking roots, particularly in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. This focus on unity at the national level has led to a downplaying of Anglo-Saxon identity in favour of broader British narratives. A second reason for this marginalisation is the romanticisation of Celtic Britain during the Victorian era. The Celts were often portrayed as noble and mystical, deeply connected to nature and the land. This view contrasted sharply with the more practical and agrarian Anglo-Saxons, whose cultural legacy was seen as less exotic or intriguing. The rise of Celtic nationalism in the 19th and 20th centuries further reinforced this imbalance, as Scottish, Welsh and Irish identity became linked to the notion of an ancient Celtic past, rather than Anglo-Saxon roots. The Norman conquest of 1066 also played a major role in diminishing Anglo-Saxon influence. After William the Conqueror's victory at the Battle of Hastings, the Anglo-Saxon ruling elite was displaced by Norman aristocracy. The Normans sought to undermine Anglo-Saxon culture to consolidate their political control, replacing Old English with Norman French in legal and governmental settings. The Anglo-Saxon nobility was almost entirely replaced, and surviving Anglo-Saxon traditions were labelled as backward or inferior. This shift in political and cultural dominance ensured that Anglo-Saxon contributions to British society were downplayed for centuries, as the ruling class traced its roots to Norman and continental European ancestry, rather than to the Anglo-Saxon period. The story of the Vikings is more subtle but still firmly present in Britain's DNA. They raided, settled and brought families with them, especially to northern areas. Viking mtDNA haplogroups, such as H3 and V, are most concentrated in places like the Orkney Islands, where Y-chromosome haplogroups tied to Scandinavia, like R1AZ284, are also clearly evident. However, their genetic influence is more localised compared to the widespread legacy of the Anglo-Saxons. But not all invaders left deep genetic footprints. Romans occupied Britain for nearly 400 years, and the Normans brought profound cultural change. Surprisingly, neither group significantly altered the local gene pool. Instead, their impact is found in architecture, language, and systems of governance, rather than in the DNA of modern Britons. What's truly fascinating is the intricate regional variation within Britain's genetic map. Modern studies have revealed 17 distinct genetic clusters, reflecting different historical layers of settlement and migration. People in Devon, for example, may have different genetic signatures than those in Yorkshire, highlighting how geography shaped genetic identity. The east of England shows the strongest genetic influence from the Anglo-Saxon period, while the west remains dominated by the ancient pre-Anglo-Saxon lineages. These Anglo-Saxons originated in what is now northern Germany, Denmark and the Netherlands. They were not a single homogeneous group, but comprised tribes like the Angles, Saxons, Jutes and Frisians. These groups shared a common cultural heritage, language and worldview rooted in a warrior society and a pantheon of pagan gods. Around the start of the 5th century, as the Roman Empire faltered and withdrew its legions from Britain, a power vacuum opened up. This presented an opportunity for these Germanic tribes to push westward. Several factors drove their migration to Britain, growing pressure on resources in their native lands, which were often plagued by flooding. Additionally, the allure of the fertile, unguarded lands of Britain was hard to resist. 
Roman Britannia, once a well-defended province, had splintered into disorganized regions by the early 400s. With no standing army to repel invaders, the island became an obvious target. Early interactions between the Anglo-Saxons and Britain weren't entirely hostile. Some of the Germanic newcomers started as mercenaries, hired by local Romano-British rulers to help fend off threats from the Picts and other marauding tribes. However, tensions arose, and many of these mercenaries turned against their employers. Over decades, they arrived in increasing numbers, with their families, weapons, and cultural practices in tow. By the mid-5th century, these groups began establishing a prolonged presence. The Angles settled in areas that would later be known as East Anglia and Mercia. The Saxons spread out across the south, founding kingdoms like Sussex and Wessex, while the Jutes took hold in Kent and parts of the Isle of Wight. Evidence of their migration is woven into place names that survive to this day, many derived from their own languages. The Anglo-Saxons spoke Old English, a language that serves as the earliest form of modern English. Rooted in the West Germanic language family, Old English was closely related to other Germanic tongues like Old Frisian and Old High German. It arrived in Britain with the Anglo-Saxon settlers during the 5th and 6th centuries, quickly becoming the dominant spoken and written language of their new homeland. Old English laid the groundwork for the English people speak today. Many common words that we still use daily can trace their origins directly back to this period. Simple yet essential terms such as house, bread, king, and woman have remained almost unchanged in meaning and pronunciation over nearly 1,500 years, making Old English the backbone of the vocabulary we take for granted today. Initially, Old English was written using runes, symbols from the runic alphabet that the Anglo-Saxons brought with them from continental Europe. These runes weren't just a means of communication. They held symbolic, often magical significance in early Anglo-Saxon culture. But the arrival of Christianity in Britain during the late 6th and 7th centuries brought with it the Latin alphabet, forever changing how Old English was written. Christian missionaries, such as those led by St. Augustine, introduced Latin literacy, ensuring that Old English transitioned from runes to a Latin script. This shift didn't just make writing more systematic, but also connected Anglo-Saxon England to the wider Christian literary tradition of Europe. Christianity reshaped Anglo-Saxon Britain through two pivotal phases. The first began in 597 AD, when Pope Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine of Canterbury to convert the Anglo-Saxons. His mission gained the support of King Ethelbert of Kent, leading to Christianity's foothold in the south. Meanwhile, the Irish Celtic Church played a crucial role in the north. Monastic leaders like St. Columba, who established a religious community on Iona, and Aidan, known for his work in Northumbria, spread Christianity with their devotion and missionary efforts. Together, these movements united a fragmented land under a shared faith, leaving an enduring religious legacy. From the late 8th century, Britain faced a new wave of invaders from Scandinavia. These were the Vikings, seafaring warriors and traders primarily hailing from Norway and Denmark, who were drawn to Britain by its wealth and fertile lands. The Viking incursions began in 793, when Lindisfarne, a small monastery on the northeastern coast, was brutally raided. This marked the start of over 200 years of Viking attacks that targeted monasteries, villages and towns. The Vikings were not just raiders, though. Gradually, they began to stay and settle in eastern England, where they established a region known as the Dane Law. This area, spanning parts of Northumbria, East Anglia and Mercia, was under Viking control and governed by their laws and customs. Life in the Dane Law reflected the blending of Viking and Anglo-Saxon ways. The Vikings introduced Norse words, which merged with Old English and influenced place names like Derby and York. They brought their distinct seafaring skills, dynamic governance, and agricultural techniques. This period of interaction left a mark not only in cultural, but also linguistic and societal developments. Nevertheless, there was also fierce Anglo-Saxons resistance in many cases. Alfred the Great of Wessex became a legendary figure for his determined defense of his kingdom against Viking advances. After defeating a Viking army at the Battle of Eddington in 878, Alfred negotiated a truce that established a boundary between Anglo-Saxon England and the Danelaw. Over time, his successors continued to reclaim Viking-held territory, culminating in the unification of England under King Æthelstan. Genetically, the Vikings' impact may surprise many. Studies reveal that although Norse settlers left their mark, Viking DNA constitutes only about 6% of modern British heritage except in regions like the Orkney Islands, 
where it rises to 25%. Meanwhile, the Anglo-Saxons, despite facing Viking domination, maintained strong genetic continuity, shaping much of Britain's ancestry. The Battle of Hastings, fought on October 14th, 1066, was a pivotal moment in English history. This fierce clash between King Harold II's Anglo-Saxon forces and Duke William of Normandy's invading army marked the end of the Anglo-Saxon era and the beginning of Norman rule in England. The roots of this historic battle lay in a succession crisis following the death of Edward the Confessor, who left no heir. Harold, crowned king by the Wittenagemot, became the last Anglo-Saxon monarch. However, William claimed that Edward had promised him the throne and prepared for an invasion to assert his rights. Just weeks before the confrontation, Harold's army had endured a gruelling march south after defeating another challenger, King Harold Hardrada of Norway, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, leaving them exhausted and vulnerable. On Senlac Hill, near Hastings, Harold's troops formed a formidable shield wall against William's mixed army of infantry, cavalry and archers. The battle raged throughout the day, with the Anglo-Saxons initially holding their ground. However, feigned retreats by the Normans lured parts of Harold's army out of position. This tactic ultimately broke the shield wall, leaving the English forces exposed to cavalry strikes. Legend has it that Harold fell after being struck in the eye by an arrow, solidifying William's victory. The battle's outcome reshaped England. With William's coronation on Christmas Day 1066, a Norman elite took control, introducing French culture, governance, and the Norman French language. This shift transformed the English court and church, forever influencing the nation's architecture and legal systems. Yet despite their dominance, the Normans were too few to replace the Anglo-Saxon populace. Studies show that while some Norman DNA entered the gene pool, the Anglo-Saxon genetic legacy remained largely intact. The genetic composition of modern Britons also offers a fascinating glimpse into the distant past, revealing the enduring presence of populations that predate the Anglo-Saxon settlement. Around 60% of British DNA is traced back to pre-Anglo-Saxon groups, with early Neolithic farmers and the Beaker people playing pivotal roles in shaping the genetic heritage of the Isles. This extensive genetic influence underscores the resilience and prominence of these early inhabitants. One notable genetic marker from this era is haplogroup R1BL21, a Y chromosome lineage that remains widespread in Britain, particularly in regions like Western England, Scotland and Wales. This haplogroup is thought to have been introduced during the late Neolithic and early Bronze Ages by the Beaker culture, an influential group of migrants closely linked to steppe ancestry. These people were renowned for their use of distinctive pottery and their advanced metalworking skills. Genetic continuity is particularly striking in Western Britain, Wales and the Scottish Highlands, with populations in these areas showing deep ancestral connections to both Neolithic farmers and Iron Age inhabitants. This continuity has been attributed to the geographic remoteness of these regions, which may have shielded them from later migrations and cultural shifts. For instance, genetic studies reveal fewer traces of Anglo-Saxon or Viking influence in the Welsh and Highlands DNA compared to Eastern England, where these later groups left a more prominent mark. The Anglo-Saxon legacy has also left an indelible mark on surnames and city names across Britain, reflecting the linguistic, cultural and geographical influences of this remarkable period. Place names were often descriptive, reflecting local geography, settlements or tribal affiliations. Many towns and villages bear the suffixes ham, hurst, or ford, each stemming from Old English. For example, ham means village, as seen in Birmingham and Buckingham, while hurst refers to a wooded hill, evident in Chislehurst. Similarly, where ford, meaning a river crossing, appears in place names like Stamford. These markers serve as linguistic clues that map the landscapes and livelihoods of early Anglo-Saxon communities. Tribal identity and leadership also played a critical role in naming places. Thousands of village names incorporate the names of local chieftains or tribes. For example, Hastings can be traced to Heista's people, named after the chieftain Heista, while Reading comes from Reda's people. The inclusion of ing or folk in these village names underscores their communal origins, signaling allegiance to a leader or tribe. Religious and cultural influences also shaped place names. Several areas reflect the Anglo-Saxons' pagan beliefs, as seen in places named after gods like Woden, Tu, or Thunor. For instance, Wensfield in the West Midlands translates to Woden's field, while Thursley in Sussex stems from Thunor's grove. 
As mentioned earlier, surnames also mirror Anglo-Saxon roots, evolving gradually as communities grew and populations spread. Common Anglo-Saxon surnames often derived from physical traits, occupations, or locations. The suffixes berry or barrow, both meaning a fortified settlement or town, persist in surnames in cities like Banbury or Peterborough. Similarly, occupational surnames like Smith or personal characteristics like Dunn carry echoes of Anglo-Saxon vernacular. Colour-based surnames, such as Reed or Glass, are tied to descriptors of clothing or terrain. Even terms like Douglas, meaning dark green, had a distinctive connection to nature that characterised Anglo-Saxon nomenclature. Over time, these names became fixed, passed through generations to form the basis of modern surnames. Understanding and respecting Anglo-Saxon heritage is crucial for appreciating the foundations of modern British identity. The Anglo-Saxons were more than settlers, they were architects of a language, cultural traditions, and institutions that continue to influence Britain today. To disregard this heritage for political or ideological reasons is to lose sight of the shared narratives that connect generations. History should not be rewritten or neglected due to contemporary sensibilities, for it is through understanding our past that we cultivate a better future.